Okay, hello, those of us joining us on YouTube. Let's carry on where we left off. One thing I do want to mention, uh, tomorrow, which is normally a lab time, of course, we will do a bit of lecture tomorrow just to try and push through chapter one and two. Um, certainly won't be at it for four hours tomorrow. That would just make people's heads explode. We'll probably do somewhere between an hour and two hours. So that lets us take advantage of this extra time while we wait to get back into laboratories. Um, let's see, yeah. Okay, so just use the same link as you have for today and Thursdays, and we'll do a bit more tomorrow at two o'clock. Right, so we talked about hybridization theory last week and talked about those atomic orbitals coming together to form those hybrid orbitals. We also have a similar theory called molecular orbital theory, which talks about the coming together of atomic orbitals, but this time to produce what we refer to as molecular orbitals. Simplest one to show would be using two S atomic orbitals, and they can come together ultimately in one of two ways. They can come together constructively in phase together to produce a new molecular orbital, which is lower in energy than either of the two original atomic orbitals that were used to make it. On the other side, the flip side of the coin, those two atomic orbitals could come together destructively or out of phase together and effectively cancel each other out. And they would produce a new molecular orbital higher in energy than the original atomic orbitals. This is how we normally see this portrayed for these molecular orbitals. The number of atomic orbitals used tells us the number of molecular orbitals produced. And generally half of those molecular orbitals will be low in energy, what we call bonding molecular orbitals. And half of the orbitals, because they come together out of phase, will be considered higher in energy than the original atomic orbitals. And they're what we sometimes call antibonding molecular orbitals. You can see there all the electron density is outside of that plane between the two carbon nuclei. And so we create this nodal plane between the, carbon, the two carbon nuclei. Nodal plane just telling us there's a point of zero electron density. And this is why the antibonding molecular orbital is so high in energy. That's not good for the strength of the chemical bond using those molecular orbitals. All the electrons are in a space away from that plane between the two nuclei. So positively charged protons in one nucleus are exposed to the positive charge of the protons in the other nucleus. That doesn't make for a low energy chemical bond. Now we're not going to use molecular orbital theory much in this semester. We're really most likely to use uh, hybridization, SP, SP2 and SP3 that we talked about last time. But we will come back and use molecular orbital theory, especially later in the year when we have to talk about what the pi bonds, double bonds and triple bonds are doing. Because we tend to explain their nature using molecular orbital theory. Hybridization is all about sigma bonds. And we'll eventually come back to this idea of molecular orbital theory when explaining what those unhybridized atomic orbitals are doing around the carbon atoms. We can also show this constructive and destructive interference for p atomic orbitals. Again, they can either come together constructively in phase to produce a new molecular orbital, which is lower in energy than the original atomic orbitals, or come together out of phase, which is what the colors are trying to represent, 
coming together destructively out of phase. And so the molecular orbital area is outside of that plane between the two carbon nuclei. So there's zero electron density here, creating this nodal plane. And that means we've got proton to proton repulsion. That's why it's higher in energy for these antibonding molecular orbitals. Just like atomic orbital theory, we stack the electrons into the lowest energy orbitals first. And so that generally tends to fill up the bonding molecular orbitals and thankfully leave the antibonding molecular orbitals empty. Okay. Looking at chemical structures, you're probably used to drawing chemical structures as Lewis structures from 141 or 151 courses. That's basically trying to fill the octets for elements in the second and third row. Duets, of course, just for the hydrogens because you only need two electrons to look like helium. And you would draw lines to represent those sigma bonds with a pair of electrons represented in every line. And then, of course, for elements like oxygen, we'd normally fill up the octet by using lone pairs. And quite often you'll see in some textbooks, they actually take those lone pair electrons for granted because certain elements have a certain propensity for making chemical bonds. And we can look at a periodic table to illustrate that. Sometimes called the combining power. From the position of the element in the periodic table, it normally infers the number of chemical bonds that we'll get. I need my pen, where's my pen? There she is. So, for elements like carbon, it's the one, two, three, fourth element in the second period, but to complete its shell like neon, it needs another one, two, three, four electrons. And that need for electrons is what we call the combining power. And it normally suggests the number of chemical bonds that we see for that element. So carbon needing four electrons normally makes four bonds. And that would complete its octet so we normally don't see lone pairs for carbon. However, elements like nitrogen, from its position in the table, let's just clear that. It's purple this time. It needs one, two, three more electrons to look like neon, and normally forms three chemical bonds. Because that doesn't make up an octet, three bonds with two electrons in each bond. So nitrogen is normally three bonds and one lone pair when nitrogen is in the molecule. And that is so common, so consistent, other than a couple of rare examples. It's quite common to see nitrogen drawn in the molecule with that lone pair left out. It is there, now some textbooks don't draw the lone pair in because it's just taken as common sense that there is a lone pair there. Similarly, with elements like oxygen, as we had in our notes there. So what can we use this time? Let's use green. Oxygen from its position needs one, two more electrons to complete its shell. So oxygen normally has two chemical bonds and of course, that wouldn't make up an octet. To make up its octet, it needs two lone pairs. Certainly, it'd make it electrically neutral as well. So those lone pairs, two lone pairs that we normally see, are quite often just left off the structure as it's drawn. People take them for granted. So just be aware of that. It's the same for the other elements which are in the same common, uh, column. Phosphorus would also often be drawn with three bonds with its lone pair missing, but it is there. 
Likewise, sulfur, like oxygen, would be drawn with two bonds and two lone pairs. And then the halogens are sometimes drawn with one bond, and sometimes those three lone pairs which are needed to complete their octets, like the elements in the noble gas group, are often omitted. Depends on the author, depends on the book that you're using. Some authors put them in anyway, some authors leave them out. So you might see a structure with oxygen in this alcohol, ethanol, drawn like this. Or if you've got an author who isn't so lazy, he will draw them in. Just be aware that they might have been left off. And we can relate it to the number of chemical bonds we expect. However, more commonly, organic chemistry books will take a Lewis structure and simplify it down into what we call a line angle formula. So given a three examples here of ethane, hexane and cyclohexane, if we're doing the full structure, like a Lewis structure in 151, we'd have a backbone of carbons, or in cyclohexane's case, into a ring. My pen working again. And of course, we have to draw in those individual carbon to carbon bonds and carbon to hydrogen, carbon to hydrogen bonds to illustrate the octets being made. Sometimes you'll see condensed structures used where they just emphasize the carbon to carbon bonds. But we still put in the number of hydrogens and you just have to assume that there's a sigma bond each time for each hydrogen as it's attached to the relevant carbon. But what you're more likely to find is that authors in these textbooks take it a step even further and draw what we call line angle formulas. Let me try and get this all on the same page. Well, the only thing it's drawn is the line, the sigma bond, for the carbon to carbon bonds in the molecule. Everything else is just about omitted from the structure. Unless you've got an atom which is non-hydrogen and non-carbon, then you have to put the chemical symbol in. So for an ethane, it comes down to just a line. And every time the line ends in a point, is the implied position of a carbon atom. Or if the line changes direction, it's the implied position of a carbon atom. Hydrocarbon molecules normally zigzag back and forth on themselves. And we'll talk about that in a later chapter, the alkanes chapter, and explain why that is. Basically, the molecule is getting as comfortable as possible by adopting the lowest possible energy conformation. Likewise, in a cyclohexane, every time the line changes direction, it's the implied locality for a carbon atom. Because for these hydrocarbons, there must be hydrogens as well. And then we subtract the number of bonds from that atom, from four, and we get the number of hydrogens attached. So for the carbon here, there's one bond. We know there should be four bonds to make an octet. So that means that there must be those three hydrogens and their bonds which have been omitted. Likewise, a structure here, terminal carbon, which is one bond to a neighboring carbon. So there has to be three carbon to hydrogen bonds which have been omitted. For the next carbon, there's one, two bonds projected from it. So there's only two hydrogens bonded to it to make up its octet. Same with its neighbor and its neighbor and its neighbor. And finally, that final neighboring carbon, a terminal carbon with only one bond coming from it. So to make it up to four, there must be implicitly three carbon to hydrogen bonds which have been left off. Likewise with the cyclohexane, two bonds coming from each carbon position. So there's two hydrogen bonds implied at each point 
in the cyclohexane ring. This is one of the things we'll have to get used to this semester, drawing the molecules as line angle formulas. Remember, all of the carbons need an octet, so each time they should have four chemical bonds. Excuse me, I hear my daughter calling, so let me take a quick break. Yeah, baby, what is it? You okay? Ah. Ah. Right, sorry about that. My daughter, four year old daughter, has been a big frump about eating her meals today. She thinks she can get to eat Twizzlers if she doesn't eat her meal. So we had a negotiation there. And so she's eating a sandwich, then she can have a Twizzler. Right, any questions at this point? Doing okay? Still awake? Maybe. Oh, we've got a thumbs up. Okay. That is a good sign. Right. So, quite often you'll see these line angle formulas written instead of the full Lewis structure. There's just so many carbons, so many hydrogens in organic molecules, we just get lazy and tired of writing all these chemical symbols. So we normally just limit it to drawing the backbone of the molecule, that backbone based on the carbon to carbon bonds. When thinking about these line angle formulas, again, just think about the natural connectivity, as we've been alluding to. Carbon doesn't normally have any lone pairs. It's normally one, two, three, four chemical bonds. If there was any other combination, then there would be an electrical charge, and we would have to show that electrical charge. We omit the hydrogen sometimes. Sometimes we don't show the carbon symbol. We even sometimes don't even draw the lone pairs, but if there is a non-neutral atom, an atom with a formal charge, 
then we would have to show the charge in the structure. And a good example of that that we'll be talking about soon is something that we call a carbocation. So some molecule, we just draw a butane derivative of four carbons. And let's say that on this carbon number two here, instead of having two hydrogens attached to make up its octet, it only has one hydrogen, which may, would mean that there was an empty hybrid orbital in the molecule. And that empty orbital, without a share of electrons, would cause an electrical charge. We'll talk about this in chapter two. But, let's see, yes, it did come up there. When we work out the formal charge for an atom, you've probably seen this in 151. But we'll do some practice, maybe even today, before we finish, or certainly tomorrow. You've got the periodic table position for the element, which is the fourth element in the second row of a carbon. And if there's just one, two, and then a third bond to a hydrogen, three bonds to it, Why is that not working suddenly? There we go. There'd be a plus one charge. And so if we didn't have the full complement of carbon to hydrogen bonds, we would have to, to denote that atom with a formal charge. The most common one seen is actually a plus one charge for a carbon. But we're getting ahead of ourselves here. Just be aware that if it didn't have an octet, there would be charge. So likewise with nitrogen, as we showed from the periodic table, nitrogen normally has one, two, three chemical bonds and a lone pair. And it can be any combination of three bonds and a lone pair. So maybe there's a carbon to nitrogen double bond and a single bond with the lone pair. Or maybe a carbon to nitrogen triple bond with the lone pair. It all adds up to the same thing each time. Three bonds and a lone pair. So a full octet for the nitrogen and electrically neutral. The one exception to that we sometimes see is when that lone pair is used to make an additional fourth bond. The nitrogen is giving up control of one of the electrons because that now becomes a shared pair of electrons. And that would give the nitrogen a formal plus one charge just as we did with carbon. Again, looking at the position of nitrogen in the table, it's the fifth element in the row, but it only controls one electron from each of these four bonds, and that gives us a formal charge of plus one. So plus one would have to be shown if that was true for nitrogen. If it's electrically neutral, it's a pretty safe bet because it's got its full octet as normal with three bonds and a lone pair. Even if the picture doesn't show that lone pair in the picture, for it to be electrically neutral, that lone pair has to be there. Again, we can show why if it wasn't. So let's say that lone pair wasn't there. Nitrogen, the fifth element and it should control, to be neutral, five electrons, one electron under its control from each of the bond, but without the lone pair, would only come to three. So that would be a plus two charge on the nitrogen if that was true. So if it doesn't have its quarter of electrons to make its octet, you will see a formal charge, and that would be written on the structure for nitrogen. Does that make sense for everybody? So even if the lone pair isn't shown, if there isn't an, electri an electrical charge attributed to the atom, then we can be pretty confident that the lone pair is indeed actually there. The author who drew it just was being lazy. Similar argument for oxygen. It's normally two bonds and two lone pairs because that gives us electrical neutrality for an oxygen atom. It's the sixth element 
in the row. So it should control six electrons to be electrically neutral. One electron of the two from each chemical bond. So one, two, and then the lone pairs, a third, a fourth, a fifth, a sixth. So whether it's two bonds and two lone pairs, or one double bond and two lone pairs, that's still two bonds making up the double bond, there'd be no charge on the oxygen. And if oxygen doesn't have its normal two lone pairs of electrons, that's going to create a formal charge. So if one of the lone pairs becomes a bonding pair, instead of controlling six, it only controls one, two, three, four, five electrons, creating that plus one charge. And if it actually gets rid of one of its bonding pairs and turns it into a third lone pair, that would give it control of one, two, three, four, five, six, and one of the electrons in the bond, a minus one formal charge. So if you're dealing with a structure which omits those lone pairs, a formal charge would be a telltale sign that we don't have the normal two lone pairs for oxygen. Personally, I like to keep them in because I think it keeps things nice and simple. And with the halogens in group seven, like chlorine, fluorine, bromine, etc., they're only one box away from the end of the row on the table. They only normally have one chemical bond. They normally have two, four, six lone pair electrons. And almost any other combination will generate a formal charge for the halogen atom. Any questions? Very quiet and polite today, as everybody seems to be. Doing okay? Either I am super duper good, or I'm just kind of making people lose their will to live. I sometimes hear that on the Zoom lecture, I just hear this little, oh, in the background, somebody's soul is just leaving the body. I couldn't take it anymore. Okay. Right. So similarly for other elements like phosphorus, silicon, and sulfur. Again, if we check back with our periodic table. So for the silicon from its position, it needs one, two, three, four more chemical bonds. So for silicon, it doesn't normally have any lone pairs of electrons. Just like carbon, just as it's in the same group as carbon, group four. You think about phosphorus, look at its position in the table. There's phosphorus there, so one, two, three boxes shy of argon. So we normally see three chemical bonds. And therefore, to make up its octet for phosphorus, we would be expecting to see a lone pair of electrons. Some people sometimes omit that lone pair. But if that lone pair wasn't truly there, there'd be a formal charge in the phosphorus. So the lone pair must really be there because it's the fifth element in the row. With the lone pair, it controls five of the eight electrons. It's the only way for it to be electrically neutral. I hear my daughter calling, excuse me. Let's see what time is it. That's a good point for a, a break anyway, I think. So let's take about seven or eight minutes, come back at 2.45. Um, I suspect my daughter has eaten her sandwich and is therefore ready for a Twizzler. We shall see. Have you eaten your sandwich? No. 
Okay, let me pause the recording as well. So that tricky daughter of mine was looking for a Twizzler after only eating the cheese in her cheese sandwiches, left all the bread. So that was a no, and I'm back to the drawing board for her if she wants a Twizzler. Thinks her daddy has a soft touch, I'll show her. Okay. So four chemical bonds expected for silicon, no lone pairs. Three bonds for phosphorus and a lone pair. That's the only way for it to be neutral. And so if there is a charge shown in the top right hand corner, that would mean that something else is going on. A different number of bonds and lone pairs. And then finally sulfur from its position in the table. Sulfur like oxygen needing one, two more electrons to complete its octet. So like oxygen, you normally expect <coughs> two chemical bonds and two lone pairs. Some textbooks, some offers will show you sulfur without the lone pairs added. But if the lone pairs weren't there, there would be a formal charge shown for the atom. So just two bonds and no charge, that suggests that the lone pairs are indeed there for sulfur, just like oxygen. So familiarize yourself with the expected number of bonds and lone pairs. It'd be useful going ahead in the weeks and months. If we wanted to turn these uh, line angle formulas back into uh, the full structural formula, let's take a reference point or starting point. Let's start from there. So that's an implied position of a carbon. And because there's only one chemical bond running from it, the implication is that there's three carbon to hydrogen bonds. Like an umbrella projecting off at that point. Then we move down the line, down the sigma bond to the next carbon atom. That deviates off in two directions to two different carbons. Goes for the carbon here at this intersection. It should have an octet, four bonds normally. You're seeing one, two, three. So there's a bond missing, which must be a bond to a hydrogen. Then for the terminal carbon here, to make up its four bonds, there must be three hidden carbon to hydrogen bonds. For this carbon here, that's the point we've got to now. It projects off in another two directions. And of course, to make up its octet, one, two, three bonds, one bond short. There must also be a carbon to hydrogen bond attached at that point. And a carbon at the bottom, oh, I'm running out of room, of its own three carbon to hydrogen bonds. And up to the next carbon, terminal carbon once again, and so another one, two, three carbon to hydrogen bonds. Just more like a pi symbol or something. I love this pen for drawing on the screen, but they've put a big button on it in the front, and every time you press the button, it scuppers what you're trying to draw. So there's the actual full structural molecule from the condensed. We're just taking out a lot of the clutter. The most important bonds in any hydrocarbon are the carbon to carbon bonds making up the backbone to the molecule. <laughs>
next one with the free methyl pentane. So we take this as a starting point here. That's a carbon with three hydrogens attached. So we'll draw them back in. We slope down to the next carbon, then slope up to the next, then go up to 12 o'clock and across to the right. And down here for that last carbon. Oh, why did I draw that as a hydrogen? So there's a skeleton, our backbone there. For this carbon, it needs two bonds to make up its octet. Here, one bond to make up its octet. Two more for this position. Three more for this position, being a terminal carbon. And then of course, three more for this terminal carbon. Every time the chain comes to an end, there must be a CH3 group, but that was rubbish. Finally, the 2,2-dimethylbutane. We start at this point, put in a carbon there, slopes down to the next one, up to the next, and then off in three separate directions. So the three remaining carbons, there's our backbone to the molecule. So three hydrogens attached here. Two, attached there. The orientation of the hydrogens isn't terribly important other than try and make it look reasonable. Try and space them out as much as possible or something reasonable. A carbon in the middle here. Of course, with four bonds already attached, it doesn't have any hydrogens attached. Okay, straightforward. No big deal. Some of you might have already have seen this idea before. It's always good to get the basics down before we start to try and run and look at alkanes and cycloalkanes in chapter three. Next one, with the full formula, condense it down into a line angle formula. Take a couple of minutes, try this. I'm just gonna check and see how much of that sandwich my daughter has eaten. Hey buddy. Really good boy. Do you want to see little boys' teeth? Sure. Oh, you need a mole. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 Um, it's a spacer to keep them from moving around each other. So it leaves a space for them to move around each other. We're trying to be silly, but like, you want to see my teeth? Ah! Uh, have you finished your sandwich yet? I want that. Can I want that? I want everything. Uh, well, it costed $50. Oh, my it was twenty five dollars. Wow. Yeah. I didn't realize how much it costs. Can you, yeah. Yeah. you make a deal, you make a deal. Yes. Yeah. He was being patient because it took a while to figure out where this was. Uh -huh. Ah. Ah. <laughs> 
Okay, there has been no progress in the sandwich eating, so there is no Twizzler to be had at this moment. Things you can bend me to how well that girl. Know. I'll show her. Okay. So the first one, if we take a apex carbon here at the top, so that's a dot at the end. We go straight down. We go to the left and to the right, sloping down for the next two carbons. Then we go up again to the next carbon, and then there's a triple bond. Make a straight line for the sigma bond, and then we've got two pi bonds either side. As the line changes thickness, we know that's in a, the implied position of a carbon as well. And on the other end, because it's a non-carbon atom, non-hydrogen, we actually put the chemical symbol in. There's the first one. Second one, we've got six carbons in a ring. We'll draw lots of these during the semester. But using a computer pad, I'm pretty rubbish at it, it seems. Double bonds. Line for double bond doesn't quite go as far as the single bond line normally. Double bond up to the oxygen. Double bond down to an oxygen as well. And there we've got it. And finally, the last one, let's start with the ring. There's one, two, three, four, five carbons in a cyclopentene ring. So let's draw our pentagon. There's a double bond across there. And then there's a methyl group coming from there. Nothing attached, it's just that lone carbon, and then the three hydrogens which surround it. There's also a methyl group up there. And then finally a alkyne bond coming off that carbon down there. Again, draw the first line straight across. And then the two other bonds for the triple bond. You don't have to show the hydrogen at the end, so that's it. Now, Occasionally you do see some authors, they like to add in that last hydrogen because this bond, this carbon to hydrogen bond is particularly acidic. So sometimes they like to highlight that by showing the hydrogen because they've probably got a picture in the next page where that hydrogen is gone and we've created a carbonion on that carbon, a carbon with negative charge. Okay, any questions about those? From here on in, we'll pretty much use line angle formulas anytime we draw a hydrocarbon molecule. Uh, I have a question. Sure. Uh, will we be expected to draw 3D shapes for these? Uh, I just realized Did not have my headset plugged in, so hopefully everybody can still hear me okay. Ah, oh, that's so embarrassing. Another senior moment. I had to take out this morning. So that probably sounds a bit better, a bit less tinny. Um, 3Ds, there's not much in the way of three dimensionality for orga organic chemistry. We might eventually talk about it once in a while for, um, we've got things like the chair and boat confirmation for cyclohexane derivatives, but they are fairly easy to draw. For the boat, you draw two lines parallel, but one line, the lower one, longer than the other, and then they go up and down on one side, up and down on one side. That's what we call the boat. There's not much else, and sometimes it's a chair confirmation. So you'll draw two parallel lines which slope a slightly skew from each other. And as the lines go down, then the last bond goes back up like that. And as the lines go down, or the lines go up, then the next bond 
goes back down and you get this kind of chair confirmation. But there's not a lot of three dimensional drawing for the things we're trying to do. Other than, you know, little things like if you've got a molecule of methane, maybe you'd represent the methane. There's some bonds parallel to the page just as a line then you might have some bonds coming out of the page towards you. That's when we use a thicker bond. And finally, there's probably at least one bond which is disappearing into the page away from you. And that's when you see these dashed lines. So that's about it in terms of trying to draw something in a three-dimensional stance. These particular drawings will leave to the chirality chapter where it becomes important. So not a lot of artistic merit needed for organic chemistry. Her brother has just been to the dentist this afternoon, this afternoon, and he of course got a toy for being brave at the dentist, so now she wants a toy. That's what that was about. Never ends. Okay. So I think that is the end of chapter one. Just finally a learning outcomes for the chapter. You should be able to write an electron configuration. I'm sure most, uh, all of you can. You should be, be able to predict a number of chemical bonds and lone pairs uh, based on the position of the element in the table. Remember, they're looking for octets. So carbon is four bonds, no lone pairs. Oxygen, oxygen is two bonds and two lone pairs. Nitrogen is three bonds and one lone pair, et cetera. Should be able to do a, draw a Lewis structure. We did a little bit of that, I think, but we'll certainly do a few more in chapter two. You should be able, be able to identify a bond as either being a sigma bond or a pi bond. The very first bond between two atoms is always going to be the sigma bond, and that uses a hybrid orbital. And any additional bonds, like a double or triple, that's using the unhybridized orbitals, uh, the atomic p orbitals for these pi bonds. You should be able to predict the level of hybridization looking at the structure. Again, for carbons with just single bonds, that was sp3. Uh, carbons with a double bond, that was sp2. And carbons with a triple bond, that was sp, hybridization. You should be able to predict its shape and bond angles based on that hybridization. So for sp3, that was tetrahedral with a bond angle of 109.4 degrees, we said. For sp2, that was trigonal planar, with a bond angle of 120 degrees. And then for sp, that was linear, because those two atomic orbitals making two hybrid orbitals, they stretch out onto opposite sides of the carbon, making the molecule linear through the carbon at that point. That was a bond angle of 180 degrees and calculate the chemical formula based on the line angle formula. So basically just turning a line angle formula back into the full structural formula as we've just been doing. So we've got a little bit of time left. So let's take a sneak peek at chapter two, which you should have access to. Remember all of my notes, you can just take off desire to learn. So let's see, officially 10 minutes left. What could we do? Let's just dip a toe into polarity and then we can get into the more interesting stuff tomorrow uh, with resonance structures. So when we talk about the polarity of a chemical bond, which can lead to dipole moments, and the polarity comes from a significant difference in electronegativity. Because we know from 151, that electronegativities increase as we move from left to right across the periodic table. 
and that increase in electronegativity, the element's measured ability to attract electrons, that electronegativity increases because there's an increasing number of protons in the atom. More protons, it more strongly attracts electrons to it. We also see an increase in electronegativities when looking at a group up and down the columns of the periodic table, and the electronegativity increases as we move up the group towards the top. And that's because as we move up the group, as I'm trying to show on this page, although we're losing protons, which might suggest there's a loss of attraction, more significantly, there's a stripping away of layers, a stripping away of shells. So although the elements lose protons as we move up the table, they more significantly shrink in size. And so those smaller atoms mean that the electrons are much closer to the element than the atom's nucleus. And that creates a stronger attraction for the electrons, a greater electronegativity, if the electrons are physically closer to the nucleus. And so those two things together mean that the non-metals in the periodic table have the greater electronegativity values and the metals to the left and towards the bottom of the table have the smaller electronegativity values. As a basic rule of thumb for a bond being polar, we are looking for a difference in electronegativity between and including 0.5 up to 1.9. If the difference is less than 0.5, then the bond is considered to be nonpolar. Although that's only technically absolutely true when the two bonds or the two atoms have the exact same electronegativity. A small difference does create a small amount of polarity, but it's not considered to be significant until the electronegativity difference is 0.5 or greater. So from 0.5 up to, including 1.9, that's usually the measured range for a bond to be polar. Anything greater than 1.9 is probably an ionic bond between metals and non-metals. So that's some of the ideas we had from 151 and 141. So if a bond is polar, you could often draw a dipole arrow running parallel to the chemical bond in your line angle formula. And the arrow always points to the more electronegative element. That's where the electrons are being drawn as the bond becomes polarized. And you put a little tick almost through the end of the other side of the arrow because if you get rid of the arrow head, it looks like a plus sign. And that's the end of the bond, which is delta positive. It has a, a deficiency in electrons around it. Now, in an exam, I would always just supply the electronegativities for you. I don't expect you to have electronegativity values memorized. Although you should still remember the basic trends Electronegativity is increasing as we move to the right because there's more protons and electronegativity is normally increasing as we move to the top because there's fewer shells. So these polarities often lead to a dipole moment in the molecule. Basically a fancy way of saying we've got a separation of positive and negative charge in the molecule. You can imagine that all the positive charge has mass, that charge coming from the protons, and all the negative charge has mass, of course that's coming from the electrons. If the two centers of mass for positive and negative don't coincide, then we've got a molecule with a dipole moment. Now the size of that dipole depends principally on two things the magnitude of the charge, which we term as Q, and the bond length. As the magnitude of charge increases, um, the dipole moment increases, and as the bond length increases, the dipole moment also increases. The bond becomes more polarizable with longer bonds, because those electrons 
are much more distant to the protons than the nucleus. And the further the distance, the less hold the protons have on those electrons. So the um, split between the total positive charge and the total negative charge becomes greater as the bond gets longer. So we can measure dipole moments for chemical bonds. We'll assume that there's a complete separation of the positive and negative charge, like we see in an ion. And for an ion, that measured electrical charge is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. This is a Millikan value that you probably came across in 151 in the early stages of that chapter. Um, in terms of bond length, just to give us an example here, we can assume a bond length of about 100 picometers. Sometimes a little bit longer, sometimes a little bit shorter, but that's a good average. And so normally we want to uh, change that value in picometers into meters. That's a factor of 10 to the minus 12. You get a trillion a trillion picometers to make a single meter. So we'll take that value in picometers and multiply it by 10 to the minus 12, or basically dividing it by a trillion. So we get a value in meters of one times 10 to negative 10 meters. So for that dipole moment, we take the charge, the value from Millikan's experiments, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19, multiplied by that bond length that we are taking for this one. In an example, you would be, you'd be given an actual bond length. And so we get a charge of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 29 coulombs per mole. However, we normally measure that polarity in Debye's. For well, one Debye, it's equal to 3.34 times 10 to the minus 30 coulombs per mole. And so we take our charge divided by the charge for a Debye. And in this case, it comes to a polarity of 4.79 Debye's. And that's based on a bond length of 100 picometers. When we come up to the first homework assignment, which we're almost ready for, we'll talk about the first homework assignment tomorrow. And um, if you have a calculation like this, you can follow this format. And the only new information you'll use each time is the bond length. We'll always assume Millikan's separation of charge, a value of 1.6 times 10 to negative 19 coulombs. And all the rest is just following this formatting. Just keep in mind that, that dipole moment increases as the electronegativity difference of the atoms increases, creating greater polarity, that's because the center of mass for protons becomes more separated from the center of mass for the electrons as we get greater differences in electronegativity. The dipole moment also increases as the length of the chemical bond increases. And the chemical bond length will increase as we start to use elements lower down in the periodic table. The lower down in the table, the more shells the atom has, and so the greater the bond length will be from nucleus to nucleus. And finally, the dipole moments normally also increase when one or more of the atoms has lone pairs of electrons. It increases that separation of positive mass and negative mass when there's lone pairs of electrons centered around one of the atoms as well. How am I doing for time? Oh, I'm out of time. Oh, everybody's so mad. We can't do any more. Okay, we'll stop there. Uh, we'll pick it up again tomorrow. Just use the, the same link from today. And we'll do, eh, there's a certain amount of stuff I want to get through tomorrow. But we'd most definitely won't do any more than two hours. So come four o'clock, that would definitely be our stopping point people's heads would just start exploding if we sat down for lecture for more than two hours. And that at least lets us use a bit of the time, seeing as we've been denied lab today. And probably on Thursday, I'll announce for sure 
what we intend to do when we come back into lab next week. Okay. Any questions before we finish off? No, nope, everybody's fine. Okay. We'll pick it up tomorrow. Talk a little bit more about polarity, although we've gone through most of it. Most of tomorrow, we'll look at resonance structures, which is the big, big topic for chapter two. Okay. Right. Stay safe. Wash your hands. Wear a mask, guys. And I'll see everybody back at two tomorrow.